Um, so we had the presentations on Saturday, right? I'll send an email again to stress the time and all those things. Um, but essentially, I'll get like half an hour. Um, and one of the things I would like for you to stress is how your work is related to others, like your own work or something else. Like last time, you didn't have much of a chance with the time factor. Um, so since you have half an hour, you should be able to, um, I mean, I hope it will be better than last time, right? Um, what did you just, you said how it relates to others? Other work, other, like, things that we did in this class or things, anything, right? Um, more technical, more of like, you know, even in the case, you know, even if you don't find something directly related, you can say this would help something like the, this paper be read or something like that, you know, some tie it to something that uh, we've done, right? Make sense? So, <coughs> Uh, and next Tuesday, we're canceling the class, right? So uh, I'm not going to be here. And you can use that to work on your report or what have you, right? Um, so this is the last but one lecture. And so I, I, I really like this paper because it kind of makes, you know, the, the, the argument is they're going to change fundamentally a whole lot of stuff, right? Um, so if you believe this argument, you'll get rid of file system, you'll get rid of memories, you know, change the way memory is done and everything into a totally new concept, right? Um, so the idea is you have such a large address space, so you don't have to give private address spaces to different processes. You have one address space which is global, which is there forever and ever, right? So when I write a program, I get an address space, it, it lives in this address space, and my program exists in that state, right? So it will be a file system if I leave it, if I don't garbage collect it, right? So if, if I tell the system this particular space can be garbage collected, it's garbage collected. Otherwise, it can be returned to a disk. So there's no notion of a files or, or uh, processes. Because the observation is really what you do is every process, every file, they all act as private virtual addresses, right? So when you write a file, you have a uh, you know, offset from zero to the file size. And when you use your program, you have offset from zero to whatever. And you do whatever you want in that, in that space. But when you're done with it, you usually write everything back into disk in another format, right? So if you're using, uh, if you have some complex data structures with lots of pointers, so when you're done with, so when you're operating on it, you have like linked lists and pointers and stuff in memory. But when you're done with it, you have to serialize it into a file system. And when you want to reuse it, you have to re read it back into this nice structure, right? So that's what we typically do, right? Does that make sense? Is that, is that uh, sort of what we end up doing? Or is that, so if you think of a compiler, right? Compiler, that's what it does. It takes the, the source code, the, the first processor reads the source code, builds a nice tree of, of whatever it wants, and then it, it, when it wants to go to the next stage, it will dump it back into an assembly code in a sequential format. The next stage will read the sequential code, bring it back into a tree, and then we'll do whatever it wants, and then it'll write it back into a sequential stuff, right? You guys done this, or, um, or do you know what I'm talking about? Or? You seem very quiet today. Um, so this is something that you, you should have felt because every time that that's, most of your program ends up doing that sort of a thing. You know, it, 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 it turns into, I mean, you can build lots of nice data structures with pointers and stuff, but when you have to write it into a file, you lose all of the stuff and then you write it back into this uh, annoying stuff. So this project came about because they were developing Boeing 777 back in early 90s, right? So Boeing 777, if you realize, it's, it's one of the most uh, complex aircraft that they built, right? It's a, it's a first, I think maybe the first, or uh, uh, definitely the biggest fly-by-wire aircraft. And one of the things that Boeing does is they don't actually build these things out of you know, physical stuff. So they, they want to build these things electronically. So one, one department may build the wing, one department may build the other wing, uh, and, and some of them change the nuts and bolts and stuff. So you want the, um, so for example, uh, I may change one bolt which is used across the aircraft. So when I change that component, that gets reflected on the whole aircraft, and then somebody wants to run a simulation to see if the flight aircraft will fly. So there's one department which is designing the wing, one is, one is figuring out what uh, bolt to put, and then you kind of 
combine all of them into this massive airplane, which, which somebody else does simulation, somebody else does whatever. So, you, so the whole company is operating on this one aircraft with millions and billions of pieces of parts and components, and each one is updating it, their own stuff. So you are trying to build this massive database of all the stuff built into this large stuff, right? And if you if you read the if you think of it as a traditional way of doing stuff, you would have to read the you know. Um, so I have to define the the definition of a bolt, right? Write it into a file, and some of the process has to read all of them and then assemble whatever it has to do and then write it back. So you spend all your time reading these specs and then writing these things and building this aircraft every time, right? You read the stuff. So what they wanted to do was have somebody generate these pointers. So if somebody says, I want the wing, and I want these bolts here. So they, let's say you know, if you have a data structure called wing, and then has like a lot of pointers to the different bolts. So you create this data structure with, the, with, the, with everything. And somebody else updates the bolt, and then it changes on the fly. You don't have to change. So the whole data structure remains on the file system, right? And they realized that you can do this very well if you, if you kind of uh, follow this model of virtual single address space. Um, so you can have this um, once and stuff, right? So what other, is there any other way we can implement that goal using current existing technologies that you can think of? They, they do talk about that a little bit, right? How many of you built any kind of data structure that you have tried to disk and then read it back again? I can't imagine how you've programmed any other way, but. Uh. Okay. And and uh, you wrote, wrote so you, so what did you do? Uh, I, I serialized the okay. Java object. Yeah. So um, so if you wanted to do what they were trying to do, right, which is have this one com complex data structure. So the, the idea here is what you're trying to do is we all build data structures like this, right? Like have pointers and let's say we have this tree, right? You're operating on it, you know, it, it's, it helps you do um, stuff you, you, would, you may want, you know, you, you manipulate the pointers and stuff and you're done with it, right? And then one way is to write it serially by writing uh, let's say this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and somehow you write it as, write it in a file, right? So you write it like this, right? So this will be, this is, this is one way of doing stuff, right? In a file you serialize it like this, and somebody else who comes at the other end has to read this file and then build this tree back, right? That's what you have to do all the time, because when you use, a, when you use um, Traditionally, you build this, this the trees, which is what is easy for you to man manipulate in a program. Then you write SQL, serialize it into a file, then you read it back, right? What they're trying to do is have this exist as it is. There is no step like that. You create these, so this is all permanent addresses, right? So this, this address will remain here whenever, for all time. There is no notion of a file, right? I create this object, it stays there, forever till it's deleted. I create these links, right? So the only, so if, if this link, if this was erased by mistake, by me, then you'll have a dangling pointer. Otherwise you have this whole, data, so you, you create these things and leave it as it is, right? The having the, the, the large address space makes this feasible, but you don't actually need a large address space, right? For this concept to work, you can actually, um, even even in a small outer space, this concept will work, except you can't do too much interesting stuff, right? So the idea here is you you do this stuff. So I so I ask the operating system give me uh, uh, some memory, right? I get the memory, and in my object I point to this new memory block, and then that's it. It's it's there, right? So if I want you to share with uh, collaborate with me, I just send you the pointer, just like I would do right now. Yet I never serialize it. It's always this way, right? So you can have another process come in here, modify this to something else, and then your process would see those changes because they're all shared, right? If you, if you want, you can put locking parameters and all those things, but essentially, you want to leave it like this, right? Is you, can you achieve this, this 
mechanism without using the technique that they're talking about here. One way is to use a file and serialize it, which is what Nathan mentioned, right? Serialize uh, using a Java primitives or any, any way. Is there a way that you can manipulate it like this? Hint, you use mapp, right? Did you, uh, I think they were, they were talking about in, in the intro section, right? How many of you uh, know about in memory map files, mmap? So that comes from the undergrad OS component, right? So mmap, the idea here is you can take a file, right? It, this, this, should, should, this should have been uh, in the context of virtual memory and files, right? With the mmap, I can take a file, I can map it into my address space, so if I have a program, um, so I can attach this at a certain location, right? So then I can I can do operations on the file using memory memory uh, uh, memory like a memory system, right? So for example, if I wanted to read this byte, I can just do star ptr. Plus, let's say this is x and this is ptr, right? So if I do star ptr plus x equals one, that's the same as if you do a uh, read, I mean, sorry, write file descriptor, um, the, the byte one, and the location x, right? Rather than doing a write at a specific location, if I do a memory map, I can operate on it using memory system, right? You guys are awfully quiet today. Um, so have you used the MF, MF call? So, um, so it, you can use M, one, of the, one of the things you can do is MAP, right? MAP is used a lot on, on modern systems. So when you talk about library, your program actually does not read the whole thing. It just memory maps and then you can look at the different contexts, right? So your systems don't actually do uh, read, the, read the bytes and do memory map, right? So this is one of the things that Jerry was pointing out in his presentation last time, right? A lot of the, so even if you don't use the mature memory system for anything else, most of your files are actually memory mapped and then uh, read at least on the system level. So you never actually, so even if you don't use the swap space, use the virtual memory because that's how you use the memory map, right? So one way to implement this concept would be for you to manually ma manage this stuff, right? So manually you can, you can say, that when you do a memory map, you can say, I want this to be mapped at a certain location, right? From a program, and so that's what you can do. So if you wrote this program, where you memory map this particular block into say address 2000 in your own process and let's say I mapped it into address 3000, right? And over here I have a pointer to say 3002, right? Then I can achieve the goal that I'm talking about, right? I can manually, if I ensure that this is always mapped at address 2000. If this is always mapped at 3000, if everybody who's gonna use this particular program will map it at the same location, right? Then if I create a pointer to 3002, I will point to the right slot here because I manually made sure that this particular block is mapped at the address that I thought would be here. And that's what they, they talk about in the, in the introduction section, right? It becomes kind of messy because I have to make sure that this happens from a user space. I have to make sure that anything I map has to be mapped at the space that I did. So if I as a programmer did this, you as a programmer came about and you tried to map 3000 into your address space, right? And if your address space does not have the space for 3000, something else is being used to 3000, and you mapped it to 4000, right? Then this whole thing fails because then you're pointing to at a C1000, which in your program may be pointing to something else you had, something that is local, not, not related to this one, so everything breaks, falls apart, right? So it, as long as I can map these things exactly the same spot for every application manually, which you have to do if you don't, bad things happen, right? Why, 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 why do you think this, a, why am I saying that there's a bad things happen? Can you figure out these things and then fix it on the fly? What I'm saying is if you, if you had a memory map file, right, and you had a pointer called 3002, right, in the new process, you were mapping it to 4000. 
So can you go ahead, go back here, and then change it to 4002? But aren't, aren't the mappings going to be different? So like in one process, yeah. 3002 means something different in memory than 3002 means in the other process. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so now the, uh, you broke the first process, right? So you have to do that for all the processes, and otherwise you you fail, right? Because now it, it's a shared shared structure. So if you modify it in one process, then everybody else has a problem, right? The other insidious problem is you don't even know. So so then you have to know this data structure. You have to know where the pointers are, what are pointers, and you have to figure out where they should go, right? It's pointing 3002, which is still a valid address, right, in the new process. But you have to go through and do this stuff, and that becomes messy, so you can't do this, right? So you could do this kind of a structure if you do a map and take care of these things. In fact, some of the applications already do those kind of a things. They memory map into a certain location, so they know how to do this process, right? It works if it's not too complicated, if it, if it is only like one or two processes which are, which are dealing with this stuff. And you can find a sufficiently long address, and this is one of the places where long address comes in, right? So if your address space is zero to, let's say, 64K, right? Which means that you're likely to run out of address space, so when you do this stuff, it's likely that new process may not have 3,000. It has to be put in a 4,000 or something, right? So you run into a problem. If I increase this to infinity, right, then I can, I can say this one will go into, you know, trillion, and this one will go to the next one will be a trillion. I don't have to be, um, I, I can still run into case of, you know, uh, choosing the same address. But if it's such a large number, then you could randomly choose an address. I can randomly choose an address. I can be sure that it'll always be valid, right? Because it's it's such a large number, right? So if you had a 64-bit address space and you're doing this same map, you could still do it if you're careful on what you do. And and if you have a large address space, it actually works. So if you're say for example, if you're doing PowerPoint or something, if you're Microsoft and you're doing PowerPoint and you want to share a file between PowerPoint and Word and uh, something else. They can do this stuff because there's only like few applications out there, and the amount of things that they have to do is, is fairly small. So that this this hack may work for the most part, right? When you're talking about the sort of things that they were talking about, you know, in terms of building uh, Boeing 747 with millions and billions of parts being operated by a large number of users, this particular application may not work. So that's the motivation for why they started going along this route, right? So one of the things that really help you is having a really large address space, right? Really large address space means that I don't have to be, so if you had a small address space, and this happens to be, let's say, 4K, right? If I want to grow this space, if I want to make it larger, then I need to find some space here, right, in the, in the address space, right? And I may get into a problem where if I want to grow it too big, I may get into some other object, right? So if the address space is really, really large, then I can give you enough bits so that I can grow and shrink how much I want. The segments that they talk about can grow and shrink because the address space is practically infinite, so I don't have to be too careful, right? You will still run into a problem which they don't really address, which is it's kind of hard to address, which is what happens if you run this operating system for, like, say, 300 years, right? You at some point, you, it's not infinite, right? It, it, it's going to come into a problem, right? So that's one of the things that... Um, these folks had a problem with, which is 64-bit, it's fairly long, and, you know, um, right? Would it, would it be forever, right? The, they didn't mention it in this paper, so the estimate of the number of, ad, number of either atoms or subatomic particles on the known universe is, I think, 2 power 78, right? So 2 power 78 is supposed to be the number of Either atoms or um, electrons and protons and stuff like that, right? So whichever, right? So if it's just atoms, then multiply it by something, right? So let's say 2 power 80 is the all the subatomic particles and the known universe, right? So the argument goes, that's a big number, right? We're not going to go beyond that. I mean, if you if you ever reach a point where we're computation, computation means knowledge, right? So if our knowledge becomes more than the number of known atoms on atoms in the known universe, we are talking in a different realm, right? We, we're not in that point. We, we can't imagine how we can generate more information than all the atoms in the universe, right? So this is the reason why IPv6 uses 128-bit address space, right? 
his assumption here is even if you could give an IP address space to each subatomic particle in the universe, you still have plenty of space left over, right? So that the same logic could be applied here. You may or may not buy it, but but it, it so it's kind of hard to I mean you know this is an exponential number, right? So it, it's a really 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 humongous number, right? That does not mean that it, it's it's going to solve all the problem because one of the things that you're going to be doing is you're going to be very inefficient. I mean, the large address space essentially means that you can be inefficient, right? You can do the same thing with the 60, you know, 30 bit address space, but you have to be a lot more efficient because you don't have that much space to waste. But when you have 64 bit address space, they're saying I can, if you ask for a uh, for a segment, I can give you one billion. I can give you, even if you ask for one byte, I can give you address space zero to one billion. I can give you. 1 billion to 2 billion and, and so on and so forth because there's so much space I can I don't I can afford to do that and I think I forget what the uh, you know if you do some if you do 1 gigabyte every second uh, it'll last for 500 years or something right so so I can be so I can run for 500 years on one desktop I mean, obviously it's not for a cluster if you run for one desktop I give you 1 gigabyte every second I can run for 500 years before I run out of space right so that's a, that's a big number right if you don't believe that mm -hmm. then you have to believe that just be, just like when you went from 32 to 64, you can go to 64 to 160, uh, 128, right? And clearly, we, we probably won't need more than that, right? So 64 is a big number. I mean, it's kind of hard to uh, imagine because 32 to 64 um, doesn't seem all that big, but in exponential terms, it's a, it's a large number, right? So if you buy that argument that if for, you know, for 500 days, you can go for a single machine. Obviously, if you have a cluster of 1,000 machines, then you cut cut that down, right? So if you have a cluster of 1,000 machines. So you can use this technique really on a global scale, right? Which they haven't, they, they kind of mention it, but they don't really mention it, right? So you can have such that all the computers in the world can run this particular mechanism where each one of them is doing the same thing, right? So I, I do a global shared space, like, uh, global meaning like global on all the machines, so when I want to access your data, I just use your pointer, right? And this pointer that I have will be unique across the whole planet, right? And clearly I can't do that with 64 bit because 64 bit is too small for that. So let's say I have 256 bit, right? Then I can do that. Then I can actually have pointers which can point to any memory in the whole in the planet, and it's unique, and I can address any of those stuff, right? They don't, they don't, they, they kind of mention it. They kind of think that we can go there. Um, and I think some of the other work looks at how you can do this in a cluster. So in a cluster, you can have the whole system have one address, right? But they don't go there. So because 64-bit, I don't think it's too, too big for that one, right? But imagine if you can do this, then the whole thing that you have to do goes away. The, you, you change the way you program, right? When you program something, I get an address space. Um, you change the assumption, right? So you, you get an address, you get an address space. You get address space uh, through like a malloc call, right? In a C program, you do a malloc, you, you get some address, you create some pointers and everything, and that's it, you just go away, right? If you want to create a persistent data structure, you basically create, do a bunch of mallocs, do memory address, memory modifications like you do traditionally, create all the pointers that you want, and you go away, and it kind of stays. It'll stay forever till it's deleted, right? So you, your programs, you don't have to read any data, data because the, the data will always be in the format that is useful to you, right? You always write the data in the format that is, that is use, useful for you as a computer scientist, not in the form that is useful for you in the file system, right? So you can have as complex data structure as you want. You can have lots of pointers going back and forth, and when you're done, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to figure out how to write it. You don't have to figure out how to read it, right? That's the that's the power, right? So if you're if you're Boeing, then that basically means that anybody can take this massive data structure which describes uh, Boeing seven 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 with all the bolts and all all those things. You as engineer can go in and replace one bolt with <coughs> with something else, for example. Then that's it. I mean, there's no unraveling it and unraveling it, right? So the, the, the concern that they don't actually do performance analysis, right? It's valid, but we're talking about different thing, right? The, 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 the challenge is 
you may or may not get performance doing this. It's not about performance. It's about the fact that you, you avoid in each program having to read and write this data structure. Now you have this, you create this you know, beautiful data structure that you want. You don't have to, to serialize it and then read it on the other end, right? So your programs will be faster because you avoid this, these two components, right? You can argue that this is this makes it more manageable. This makes it more easy, which are things which cannot be um, quantified, right? But it's a different way of thinking. I mean, it's a different different way of thinking because since it's all the stuff, right? And this sort of goes well with object-based systems. So if you if you're used to object-based systems, you create a new object and um, you know you you leave the objects around and and you're done with it, right? So the performance may it's a valid concern, but Clearly, this this is a different stuff, right? Yeah. But so, how does this? I mean, what happens when you get into a situation like you want to do source control or something or version control? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was an engineer at Boeing and I was working on the wing, I wouldn't want somebody who's working on the fuselage to have access to my stuff and then be able to go in and change stuff on the wing without me knowing about it, and I would lose all all the changes I made. So you would. Um, how how would so how would you do that right now? Well, I mean, there'd be different components that were, these components would be separate and you would combine them in some different way. Mm -hmm. So so the way I see it, you would test your component separately, right? You won't link it to the main aircraft till you, I mean, you, you test your component first before you link it, right? Mm -hmm. So you would do the same thing. So if you think of your aircraft to have, like this is the data structure for a wing, this is for a wing, this is for another wing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I take this data structure here, the wing data structure, mm -hmm. I test it, when I'm done, I link it here, right? I do a soft link, right? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it does not change the way your software works, right? If some idiot did this before this was tested, right? Mm -hmm. This is gonna fail, which is gonna happen even now, right? If some idiot did the same thing, you know, they changed the, so right now what happens is you have to manage all these parts, right? There's somebody who's, who has to figure out what parts are tested, what is not tested, to build this component, right? And you, this is the same problem here. So that person has to make sure that these pointers are, are set, right? Um, right? Mm -hmm. it, it may or may not work, but it's, it's not that different from what is being done, right? Um, clearly, they haven't, they haven't figured out what's the software engineering aspect of you having access to this one humongous data structure with all this stuff, right? I, I think they work, as close as you can possibly do from an academic setting, because they work really close with, with Boeing. I, I think I think Chase was like spending time with, with Boeing and all those things to see what the problem was. I don't know if actually Boeing used this system, um, but that's probably has something to do with how good how good the research was. I mean, you know, Boeing was building aircraft, right? So uh, I don't think they want. I mean, this this fundamentally changes how Boeing does stuff, right? I, I forget all the statistics that Chase used to say, but Boeing has like 10,000 users, you know, let's say, designing this big aircraft, right? For you to come around and say, now I can build this one data structure which all of you can manipulate on, on one large scale thing, right? It's one thing for them to say, this is really cool, we can fund you to, to look at that. It's another thing for them to say, now we're gonna move our development platform for this 777 to your technique, right? Um, my impression was Boeing and all companies are very conservative on those. I mean, they don't want to destroy all their effort, right? Because, I mean, it, it, it's basically, uh, the, the flight doesn't exist except in computers for a, for a long time before it's actually built, right? And so I think one of the, one of you mentioned that, um, was it ever deployed or, or what have you? I don't know if it was deployed, um, and I don't know why it is not deployed, because I think if you write, for a, from a programmer perspective, this is a really good scheme, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the only reason that I can think that it wouldn't be deployed is the reason that you said, and the fact that they probably want some vendor support for the OS that they depend upon for everything that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and running on a research version of Mock uh, might be the best business decision that they could make. Plus, 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 Boeing and all are a different league, right? I mean, they have to deal with uh, FAA, right? Or whoever who does the checking to make sure the aircraft flies and everything. So I don't think they want to be the leading edge of figuring out um, these these new techniques. And I mean, th there are other issues, right? I mean, these, these are mission critical systems. I don't think I would want to fly an aircraft which is designed in, um, I mean, when, when you talk to them, 
the aircraft is never built till it's all similar. I mean, all the simulation, everything is done in computers before the first thing gets built, like way down the pipe, right? So you're trusting the software for most of the stuff. And um, my impression was they don't actually test it as thoroughly after you build it as you do the model, right? Because it, these things are so humongously expensive and humongously hard to build. You don't actually build like one test model every day for, you know, and, and you know, fly into the buildings and all. I mean, they, they do all the testing in, in software, right? Um, I mean, they, they do a lot of those stuff in software. They said they do tremendous amount of tests in software, but not in, in real life, right? So, um, so would this be useful for anything else beyond this stuff? I think a couple of you mentioned that problem, right? So would this be useful for anything else beyond this integrated environment? Would this be useful for you who's using, say, let's say non-integrated environment, right? Meaning you use a web browser, email, whatever you, you guys do, right? Two, two, two aspects of it. Would it be useful or would it not make much of a difference? Or actually three aspects. Or this will actually make your life harder, right? Would it be great or, uh, nah, I mean, it, it's, it's a wash or this would be awful? Depends on how often you use data between different applications. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you only use a web browser to browse and not to do anything else, mm -hmm. then it doesn't make any difference. If you use a compiler, well, it's going to help because the compiler can just keep mm -hmm. everything in memory. But so let, let's ignore ignore trivial applications, right? Hello world is never going to use this, I and mean, Hello world does not care because who cares? Well, just about the compiler. Whenever you compile something, mm -hmm. that would be useful because you don't have to convert. To a, you don't have to write it to a file and have it be read back in by the next component mm -hmm. along the process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just whenever you're compiling anything. Actually, it's, it's a lot more than that, right? Even your text editor has some sort of a thing to do, um, syntax, you know, syntax checking, uh, highlighting, and all those things, right? So, they don't talk to each other. They can potentially talk to each other, right? Um, we don't know, right? Um, so, one of the arguments that they would make is, which may be controversial, which is not necessarily in the paper, is we don't do lots of sharing between applications because we have to pay this cost of serializing and, and unserializing, right? If you ever return a code that could be run on two different processes, two different entities, two different processes or threads or what, what have you, sharing between them is so complicated, right? You can either use stuff like um, pipes and you know filters and, and files and all those things, which keeps these two things isolated. Where one cannot modify the other one, right? And you get the horrible performance of having to serialize it and then unserialize it, right? Or you can use a thread where everything is shared between both of them. And then if you wrote any kind of thread program which has lots of threads running around, right? You lose track of all all the. I mean, you know, you have a lot more chances of of bugs and everything, right? So the argument is. We don't do a lot of sharing between different processes and stuff because the fact that it's so hard to do, right? The, the, the files are horrendous because they, they, they make you do stuff that you don't care about, which is serialize everything, or you share the whole address space, in which case it's not that good, right? I guess I would disagree. I would think that the reason that we don't, that applications don't share stuff with each other is because they don't it's so hard to agree on a common format. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that the fact that the technology is slow stops. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if you wanted two applications to talk to each other, the developers of those applications have to be in contact with each other to come up with a common data format, mm -hmm. even before you even worry about what is the actual technology transferring the data. But you also, you, you, now you have to do one more step, right? Which is, I have to figure out what the common data format has to be, and I have to figure out how to, like, if I do the serialization or unserialization, right? I have to have the common format, and I have to tell you how to how I wrote this so you're able to read it back into the data structure, right? So if you do this stuff, yeah. So both of us have to agree that this tree is the way to go, right? That in the, the in this approach and the the one that we currently do, we have to agree on, right? If you don't agree, so if I want to do this tree and you want to do a completely different tree, then we're out of luck, right? But in the current scheme. I have to write it here, and you have to be able to read this in the format that I wanted to. If, I, if you didn't, then this whole thing is lost, right? So we can avoid that component, right? We, yeah, we can avoid the first component, but we can avoid the second component, right? I 
think until there's a killer app, I mean, I can't, I can't think off the top of my head what a killer app for this would be. Why, you, like, what would be amazing with this? Other so, than the integrated environment. The integrated environment, it's obviously a super win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, but as a desktop user, I can't necessarily see where this would benefit in just, in just the amount that, mm -hmm. that the integrated environment. And until somebody comes up with that, I mean, I don't think... So, so what do you think of the notion that you don't have to write a, a concept called file anymore, right? There's no concept of file. Um, the fact that many of you, I mean, none of you have used MMAP, right? It's, it's sad because MMAP is a pretty nice way of manipulating stuff. If you know how to ma uh, map these things, right? The, the, the annoying part of MMAP is you have to figure out what address you're mapping to. If you're sharing with a couple of stuff, you need to make sure that it's mapping on the same address. If you're not careful, then bad things happen, right? But it's easy to do a trivial kind of MMAP kind of stuff, right? Um, so most of you are used to writing files and reading files in, I, I, I suppose, in a sequential form, right? So in this stuff, you don't have to, there's no concept of files, right? Would that alone make your life a lot easier? Sorry. It went to cooling, I don't know, right, yeah. So databases actually do this, right? They actually do this in the database, right? Databases actually, so when you write something in a database, you don't write it serially, right? Any, any database worth its salt. I mean, unless you're building a database for your database class for in two weeks or something where you do a serialization, right? Any real databases, they don't convert it back and forth. I mean, they, they have their, their data structure, which is all that is written all the time, right? Except it's, it's, it's only within the database. I mean, so database, the pointers point within the database, but not <coughs> outside, but that's what they, they would do, right? Um, so what I'm trying to point out is, do you think beyond those obvious cases, right? The databases are, are stuff like that, right? Um, so if you talk to the authors, they would argue that you're not thinking about it because you haven't thought about it that way, right? There are, there are a lot of sharing going on, right? There, there are very few things that you do which are completely distant from each other. Most of the things that you do are, lit, are interrelated to each other, right? You do have, have a browser which creates some, uh, which you know, downloads the, 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 um, the your HTML page or something, parses it, and then you know, sends it out to something else. And you can't, I don't know why I decided to cool down and kind of override it. Um, you can't really do, you can't really change any of the stuff right now because the, um, we don't think of it like that, right? Well, uh, yeah, but, but, I mean, I guess it, the, the point is, is that until somebody comes up with a killer application, it doesn't matter. I mean, my, my argument is you don't need a killer application. I'm saying you have to rethink the way you program from, from scratch, right? We, right now we teach you to write like, you know, a, a typical program right now opens a file or opens some input, does some processing and writes it, right? You would not do that sort of thing here, right? You would, you would start off by, you, you create this data structure that you want, you, there's no read phase, there's no write phase, right? So when you think like that, maybe you will come up with different stuff, but at the least, your programming would no longer be read, do something, and then write, right? Because you, you just leave it like that, right? Right? So what about garbage collection, right? The, I argue that the memory space is so vast, I mean, infinity, to, to 64, if you don't believe 64, let's say 128, if you don't believe 128, let's believe 256, right? 256 is way more than we can possibly want, right? Forever, right? I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, that's a really big number, right? Um, how do you garbage collect these things, right? How, what, what are the different ways of garbage collection? So what, is the, what could go wrong with this approach? There is this one obvious case where this whole thing can fall apart, right? Yeah. Address space is infinite, but storage space is infinite. Yeah, but. So I mean, you have to garbage collect at some point, because uh, let's, say, let's say in the, in the easiest case, you're working with a movie. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you keep creating copies of this, if, if Pixar keeps creating copies of this movie that's 
8 gigabytes, mm -hmm. 16, 32 gigabytes, if, and they have multiple movies and multiple people working on all these movies, eventually they'll run out of space. But how, 500 years they might run out of space, but... Yeah, but, but how would that be different, any different than what you do right now, right? Well, that's the point, is that if, you, if, if they kept everything forever, mm -hmm. every version of everything forever, you'd eventually run out of space. Now they, you do it by overwriting things. So if, if, if oh, no, no, no. So if, if right now, if somebody in Pixar makes file copies of all the files like mm -hmm. 10,000 times, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what is happening there, right? How do you deal with that right now, right? I'm sure some system administrator is going to knock on your door and say, quit it, right? I mean, if you keep copying files for no reason, right? So it's a lot easier here because it doesn't feel like anything. So you can, you can say, uh, you know, like an infinite loop program which copies memory into a new one. But I'm sure somebody will come and hit you upside the head, right? Because, you know, whatever, right? right? But I mean, you also have memory leaks, which could be a... Uh-huh, yeah, that's one thing, right? So what happens with memory leaks, right? Memory leaks are forever, right? With this approach, memory leaks are forever, right? Because unless you tell the system that this particular piece of memory is no longer used, right, you have to have a good garbage collection, especially in terms of memory leak, right? So if you had something which is, if you had a garbage collector which follows pointers and stuff, right? If you had something referencing to this piece of memory, then it cannot be garbage collected. Because if it did, if there's a pointer coming into this block, that means it cannot garbage collected, right? So if you wrote an inefficient program which has pointers all over the place, right? buggy program, which we call it as uh, uh, memory leak, right? Memory leak is not like it's, it's leaking or something. It's, it's basically, you wrote a buggy program where there are pointers going somewhere, and we are kind of quite happy with that because when you, when you exit the program, the whole memory is reclaimed, so you don't particularly, we, we care, but not as much as we should care because memory, we know that memory and files are different, right? We know that when you do memory, we shouldn't leak memory. We shouldn't leave uh, leave these things. We shouldn't keep doing malloc and not doing freeze and stuff. But we know that there is there is hope because when the program exits, all is well, right? We, I mean, the whole reason why Google Chrome exists is because browsers leak memory all the time, right? In this approach, we necessarily argue that we shouldn't be doing all those things anyway, right? Memory space is so big, I should be able to create this stuff. So if you have bugs in your program and you have all this stuff which are linked any, anywhere, garbage collecting can be very tricky, right? Because garbage collection would mean that somebody has to go and clean up all the stuff, right? Since it's so easy to share, I don't know who else is using this data structure, right? So I need to make sure, so somebody has to take control and say, I'm gonna go delete, delete, delete this block, even though it may fail one of your application because you may be uh, working uh, on one of my data structures um, without, because it's so easy to share, right? So we may, we may be sharing something. So all the stuff that I did wrong will, will exist forever until, so garbage collection would be uh, fairly tricky, right? What happens to buggy programs? which, which, which um, leaves some um, wrong pointers, right? Pointing to the wrong space or what have you, right? You're gonna have, well, you're gonna lose space on disk as well because it's implicitly on disk, it's implicitly a file. Mm -hmm. So if you ever write anything with memory leak, you're going to lose space forever. And uh, so if you don't, so if you, if you crash before you, you uh, free up the space, right, then those will be there forever too, right? So one of the problems with these, these kind of system is long term, right? Yeah, 500 years, like they say 500 years, um, the, your address space will be there kind of stuff, right? Um, so I think, the, I think the nice thing is I can build the system right now. Let's say I use 128, let, let's, let's be generous, right? I can use it for the next 100 years, hopefully, I won't live longer than that, right? So we can, I can use it, I can use the same system for all the time. I can, I can create objects all the time. I can create all the stuff all, all the time. But if you think beyond that, if you think that I, I give this computer to somebody else and they want to use it, right? At some point, it's gonna be a whole bunch of garbage because there are pointers that no one knows where they belong to and stuff. And clearing them up is not gonna be trivial because the reason why the whole thing is powerful is I can create all this stuff, right? I don't have to necessarily keep track of who is going to use it, right? 
So it, it all works well if I say, you know, I, if I as a user say, don't delete this because this, this point, you know, this whole data structure is useful, right? But if I don't come around and say you can you can erase it, then by definition the system has to keep track of those forever and ever. And at some point it can become, even though I don't run out of space, even though I may not run out of this space, I may have such a mess of useless garbage that no one else can access to, right? And I think that that's a bigger issue with this with this system, which is not that different from our modern disk too, right? How many of us are very efficient with our disk space usage, right? If I give you a two terabyte disk on your, on, on, your, uh, on your desktop as compared to whatever you have right now, right? Let's say you have 40 gig compared to two terabyte, right? We tend to create more copies, right? Because we just do that, right? Which is sort of the same thing, except it's not even that obvious. If you, so if I have a two terabyte file system with, with, uh, you know, which is practically full, I can do some uh, file operation to figure out what the, what the different files are. Delete some uh, files which obviously look like they're junk, right? If it says copy of movie one, you know, movie dot one, dot two, dot three, up to thousand, so you have to wonder the thousand copies of the movie, maybe I should delete all of them, right? But here, copy of thousand would, would be thousand, let's say, uh, like a binary tree or something. So the thousand binary tree in a memory space. And it may be used by somebody else, you know, through soft links and stuff. So it's not as obvious uh, to what I want to do, and, and that's that's a, an eye part, right? And that they they never got around to that because that's um, that's a that's a different challenge. This long term kind of stuff and and how this will be use, useful, right? It also seems that file formats would be harder to document because there's no. In the long term, you mean? Yeah. So long. So then you get into different kind of research, not addressed by this one, which is how do we do long term stuff, right? We are horrible in doing long-term stuff, right? Because we don't know how to do anything beyond a certain number of years, right? So how many of you have uh, documents in, say, WordPerfect or um, one of those earlier formats of word processing, right? How many of you know what WordPerfect is? <laughs> I'm getting too old. There's only three or four it's people who are, huh? It's still around. But look, there's only three people well, who it's, know. It was, it's the, it was the word processor killed by Microsoft because they wouldn't give them a printer try. Regardless, right? I'm saying only three or four of you have, have even heard of WordPerfect, right? Okay. So, um, so even now, right? I mean, if I have WordPerfect document, which essentially means that WordPerfect document is this, right? And it, it cannot be useful till you at least get to this part and then go from there, right? It has to be, I mean, you have to read the file to understand, not just understand, understand to figure out what the structure it was written, right? But, I, but I, would, I would contend that it's easier to reverse engineer a file than a memory footprint. I would argue the other way, because at least here, I know what this, the, the tree would look like. Here, I won't you even know what the tree. You don't know what's a pointer. What? You don't know what's a pointer oh. anyway. Because it's, it just looks like, oh, it's just a whole, it's the block of memory. So it's, but it's gonna be less, it's not gonna be formatted as nicely as that, because it's gonna be however malloc decided to give you memory. It's just going to be everything all over you. So you might have a better case of saying, okay, this is what a record looks like. This is what it stops around, maybe. But in general, you could be like, oh, look, here's a whole bunch of text stored in a file, and here's some header. So I, I, I actually <coughs> honestly don't know what, which one is better, right? Clearly, we have done this, and we have failed, right? Like, like WordPerfect or something, if you, I mean, um, what's that, like the NASA Viking files from 70s and stuff that they wrote, um, you know, the, the, the spacecraft, they wrote the data. They don't have the header format to know what was written or how it was written, right? So they ha now they have a big tape of data which they don't know how to read, right? Essentially, they have this, but they don't know how to reverse engineer it back to here, right? And they have a different problem, which is the, the hardware for the drive itself is going away. So they may have the tape, but no actual way to read it. I mean, the, the tape, you, I mean, so if, when, you, when you think of a hard, you know, when you think of a tape, right? You need the tape, but you also need the tape reader, right? So if the tape reader becomes obsolete, right? How many of you remember the eight-inch uh, floppy, floppy disk? Have you heard of eight-inch floppy disk? Five and five and a half inch. Okay, so the three, what's the three, three and a half inch, right? Three quarter. Three quarter inch. So. Double density. Yeah. So this one does not have three quarter inch, right? So if you have three quarter inch, at least you have some hope of finding something, right? So, I mean, uh, clearly these machines don't have it. 
But there exist machines out there right now which can do three and a half, uh, uh, three quarter inch, right? How many of you have seen a five and a half uh, recently? I haven't seen it in a long time. What? Not since three and a quarter. So if you have one, you, there probably are a few around the planet that you can kind of find, you know, use as something. Even if you have the, the, the unit, you don't, you know, you're not able to trade it. Eight and a half inch, eight, eight, eight inch, right? I'm guessing you're going to be out of luck, right? Because no one has the, the thing to read it, right? So long-term research is something that we know very little about, right? I would contend that you could build an eight-inch out of parts that you can find a radio shack, eight-inch reader out of parts you can find. No, I'll give, give it another couple of years. I'll give it another decade, right? Then you'll lose that, right? No, you can build the stuff, but I'm saying you, it's not only building the magnetic head, but also the, the protocol of what's written there, right? right. Um, but I think you could get it off of that medium onto something else. If you, if you really, really want it. But we're talking about like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of effort to get that stuff, right? So, no, I'm saying, no, th those are valid concerns, right? I mean, th this paper touches on that concept, which is, we all, so when, th when did computing start really from your perspective? When do you think that computers really start from your perspective? Or when is the first time that you were present on a computer? Um, in terms of some creating some data, right? When, when was the first time that you existed in, in some data form? When was the first time you used a file and wrote something, when it, a PC and wrote something? Apple TV. When, I mean like when? 80, 80. Okay. Um, I play my games, so I had to have a user. Yeah, I think I was 84. So did we exist before, did anyone exist before then? Right. So let's say let's go with 84, right, as the earliest, right. So we only we only used from 84 to like about 24 years, right. Whatever I did back then is not readable except for the text files, right. All the stuff that I, even if I had a like you know even the uh, PDF documents from back then in PDF one, right. I'm not convinced that the Adobe PDF reader would be able to read PDF version one, right? One of the biggest challenges, one of the things that like some other people are beginning to work on as a research problem is to figure out what it means to have a long-term storage, right? 100 year, 200 year time frame storage, right? And there are lots and lots of issues that not necessarily you know, brought up by this paper, but, but comes up which we don't know how to deal with, right? One is all the notion of user IDs and stuff would be gone, right? So if you have a f if you have a file returned by me, right, and I give it to you, and you come back in 50 years, right? Chances are you you have no idea the provenance of what happened, right? So I I leave, but the computer stay, right? 24 years is not a long time. I mean, I, I can exist for 24 years, but when you talk about 100 years or something, the principles and the users and authors and all those things go away and the, system, the files survive. So there's an issue of um, the, the, the storage media and stuff. There's an issue of how, like, whether these things make sense. Even if, you, even if you copy the file over and over again, right, the, the, the readers kind of go away. There's, there are other issues, right? There are other issues which we don't talk about in, in traditional computer science, which is, most of the things that we consider to be stable, like the file systems and all those things, are not really stable, right? They're stable in the time frame of a day or two or whatever, right? So if I, if I leave a system on for, for a long time, there's all this alpha race and all those things hitting and changing bits along the way, right? So if I use it within, uh, within a few weeks, the probability of the bit staying is fairly good that I can consider them to be stable, right? So if I store a file and I come back after 100 years, right, there will be enough bit rot that I will lose some bits, right? And that is not actually solved by making copies, right? So if I make copy, so if there is a alpha ray or one of the cosmic rays hit and then change a bit, whatever. So if I copy that file over, I would have copied the, the misplaced bit, right? And I, I do this stuff, right? So there, there are a lot of effort trying to, so when we replace all the stuff that we have with the, with the digital stuff, especially libraries and stuff, right? What happens if I come back in 200 years and all the things are lost because the, the bits got flipped over the, over, the period of, um, over the duration of where we went, right? So those are, those are excellent challenges. Um, 
nobody really wants to look at it that much from an academia perspective because it's not very glamorous. Because we don't understand, because I only know how the world was for the last 24 years, so I can't really predict how it will be for the next 200 years or so. Right? So many people don't know how this is going to turn out and stuff, but that's a um, that's an excellent point. But the problem is, this one, the beauty is, I can do that for the future. And the, off, the, the, the weird part is, we have no clue how to do that anyway. So we claim that this can, be la this can last for 500 years, even though we have no clue what it means to run a system for 100 years with the same darn address space, with the same uh, data structures and stuff, right? So you're going to have like a big mess, uh, or, or, uh, or what have you, right? Um, Yeah, so the, I think, I guess the, your, your comment was, um, well, it's not useful, right? Um, so yeah, they would argue that this, this is a new way of thinking. So if you had this way of thinking from day one, right? So if you, if you talk to Jeff in 95 and stuff, right? He would argue that every program you do, every program you write, whether you realize it or not, you are spending all the time trying to figure out how to write it, how to read it back, right? You, 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 you worry about how to checkpoint it and all those things which you don't have to do, right? On the other hand, when you use this system, everything is forever, right? So if you create a data structure with the messed up, uh, messed up pointers and stuff, you better clean it up, because otherwise it's gonna stay forever, right? If your program crashes, you gotta go delete all the stuff, otherwise you're gonna end up for a long time, yeah. So if I, if I had a, a word processing mm -hmm. program, then I need to have some idea do, you, do they still use file names or, or as pointers to the, to the file of memory? Or how do you get access to a file if you have a word processing program that doesn't live all so, the time? So when you, when you talk about a file name, right, like right now, right, you have a name, you ask somebody, which is your directory, right, to know where the inode is, right? So you do the same thing, right? The same thing. Yeah, you do the same thing. So, the, so you can still build a file system like thing on top of it oh. where you give a name, right? So here you would, you would call it, you know, file.c or something, and it'll tell, it'll give you this give space you the to the start. for the stuff, right? If that word makes sense, right? Well, that's, but I mean, that's, it sounds like that's the only thing that makes sense is... If, so in this system, you can, have, you can have weird stuff, right? So this one can be called, you know, foo.c. But it lives, in, it lives, basically you get access to the memory space of that. Thing. Yes, and, and one of the things I didn't mention at all, which, is, which, which seems obvious, is you need to have security, right? I mean, the, the whole reason the paper existed, once you believe, once you uh, believe this argument, is that you need to have security, right? Otherwise, I, th I think one of you mentioned, what if everybody can read everything else, and how would I have privacy, right? Clearly, that's one of the things. I mean, if, if, I, if you don't have protection, right, this is a terrible idea, right? If any process can modify any address space, now you're saying any process can modify any address space forever, right? So if you have another process which comes in and modifies this pointer, it should not be, then this is a horrible idea because now everybody would be messed up. So you have to make sure that only the right person can have access to it, right? And, and one of the, uh, 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 we'll see the comment a little bit, but they mentioned, so what happens if I give you permissions and you do bad things, right? The same thing which happens right now, right? If I give you access to my file and you, you corrupted it purposefully, then um, I'm gonna have to chase you down. And same thing here, if I, give you, if I give you the privileges and you mess it up, that's not our problem, and that's, that's, a, that's a bug bug issue, right? But you have to make sure that nobody else can access to it. So in, in this example, you know, if I give you access to the file.c, I'm not only giving you the pointer, but I'm also giving you the pointer that you have access to, to, to operate, right? So you can't, you can't create uh, uh, credentials to get in, right? So that's, that's part of their system. So if you, you, have to, you have to be given some sort of a credential to access any kind of stuff, otherwise the whole, whole system falls apart, right? And, and that's, that's, the, that's the key there, right? Uh, yeah, and, and they, didn't, they didn't talk about the, the cluster issue, right? Adrian had about the cluster issue. People, the, 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 some of the work which is on creating a cluster, right? So this, depending on which your perspective, this could be a really great thing, which is I can have a cluster with the pointers going across to different machines and they're still valid, right? Um, they didn't get as far as, as Opal did because I think it becomes way more complicated, right? Failure now becomes like horrendously complicated, right? 
Because if I, so when I have the failure model here on a single machine, if the machine dies, right, this whole data structure is not use, uh, accessible to me, uh, fine, right? But if I have a cluster of machines, let's say all, each, each chair is a, is a machine, so I, I create a data structure where the pointers go from one machine to another machine and, and, and so on and so forth. And if it's completely transparent, I have no idea where things are and everything is like, you know, beautifully set up so I can get this, you know, everybody can modify the whole system. But if, if one of them crashes, then my whole system becomes horrendously complicated. And I don't think they quite got over that fact because if all of the machines work, then I get this global memory uh, across the whole system and I get the, the, the very beautiful shared memory across the, the cluster of machines. But if some machines start to fail, then, you know, um, so whatever problems Opal has, you have like Opal times the number of clusters and, and that's, it, it's a valid point. And, and um, unfortunately, there hasn't been much work. There's a lot of uh, enthusiasm about this kind of work in the mid 90s kind of thing. And we haven't followed up on that. So that's one of the things I, I meant to ask um, Chase, because hopefully I'll see him at OSDI, uh, which is what happened to it, right? Because they were talking about a time when 64-bit machines would be, uh, their car file just came out, right? So that's the first 64-bit machine uh, and, and they were excited, right? Now everybody has a 64-bit machine, so it seems like this is the time for something to happen, right? Um, but in, in general, I, I don't think the operating system community is like doing too much of this kind of uh, research these days, and I, I don't know why. So that would be interesting to find out what, what happened. Like the future that you are imagining is here, why aren't you, you know, uh, the one we, we all use, right? Um, so I had a question about the, the, the comments that you guys had about the chips fail, right? Yeah, so I guess we just kind of say that I think we need some abstraction at some level. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't eliminate all the abstractions. And if, if you were to extend this idea and say, okay, let's forget about virtual memory, you've got a hard memory, you still need, if you had a lot of hard memory, you still need an abstraction some point if you want to be persistent for But, but like, the, the, the problem with the memory chip failure, right? Yes. How would, you, how would you deal with it right now? Oh, I mean, I guess now there are systems to either replicate memory or redirect mm -hmm. the addresses. But they can work that right now in, in this model too, right? I mean, all they're doing is a virtual address, not the physical address, right? Right, yeah, I guess what you're saying. They, they seem to kind of, I mean, if you were to extend it, get rid of the hardware virtual address, you should still have just, you still need to oh. want the abstraction. Oh, no. I think you need to have virtual addressing, right? Because they, they're not claiming that if you don't have virtual addressing, right, all your physical address would be equal to a virtual address, right? In which case, 2 power 64 means that you need to have a machine which has 2 power 64 memory, right? Nobody believes that you, you, you're ever going to have 2 power 64, at least not, I mean, they don't believe that we're ever going to have that much memory on a single machine, right? I know machines are like you know, getting you know, bigger and bigger, but 2 power 64 is a really, 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 really big number, right? So um, maybe it's the, all the atoms in solar system or something. So I don't think we're gonna have that big memory in, in one machine, right? So you're gonna have much memory anyway, right? So whatever you do right now would, would apply here, right? Um, Yeah, the, the issue of integrated versus uh, non-integrated. And why are you not using it? Because I haven't heard anything about this. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I don't think that has anything to do with why this is not popular. It's not popular because it's not popular, right? Um, I I, I just the support, the lack of support has to be a major issue. But that, that's true for any, so in, in general, right? Microsoft, Apple, or something are not going to embrace this kind of a stuff anytime soon, right? I mean, they're kind of happy with their process and, and, and what have you. They're, they're, um, they're pretty happy to say that um, your new version of operating system, when you go here, you know, instead of changing red to yellow, whatever, right? I'm, I'm not exactly faulting them, but I'm, I'm saying they're quite happy to change these little stuff, not completely dr drastically change everything where you get this abstraction, which may be extremely efficient in what you have, whatever you have to do, but it'll make you rethink everything that you, you know how to do, right? You're, you're, so if you believe this argument, then I have to go back to you know, programming 101 and say, from now on, there's no concept of files, right? Files are basically, if you, if you, call, if you allocate a memory and if you, if you leave it 
If you don't garbage collect it, it's file. It, it is persistent, right? So I have to tell people because otherwise, the whole bunch of users are going to come in and say, "How do I do read?" Right? So you have to map, map. If you have to map read into this model, 